everybody. A very good evening to all who are joining from India. And if you're joining from somewhere outside of India, good morning or good afternoon. I am Bidisha Bhattacharya, Growth Manager of Stack.me. Welcome to the second season of the Stack.me Academy Masterclass on Contemporizing and Translating to Gore. Stack.me Academy is our initiative to ensure those who are on the platform and also creators around the world as well get to be better at things they are focusing on. For instance, writing, audio, podcasts, business writing, fiction, photography, illustrations, and a lot other different topics that we are going to run our masterclasses on. With that, I'm really excited to present our masterclass today with Jashodhara Chakraborty on why and how she contemporizes Tagore. Jashodhara Chakraborty is an author, translator, executive, and teacher. She has published two books for young adults and cut her teeth in translation with another adventure for young adults by acclaimed 20th century Bengali author Hemendra Kumar Roy. On Stack.me, she translates Rabindranath Tagore's first opera, The Illusion Game. She is also a TEDx speaker and a visiting lecturer at IIM Kori Kod, where she teaches storytelling for business. In this masterclass, she will talk about her translation project, why she chose to do it, and how she reimagined Tagore for a readership that would probably not ordinarily explore his work. So without further ado, I will hand the floor off to Jashodhara ma'am. And at the end of the session, we will have Q&A. So wherever you are following this masterclass, please drop in your questions in the comment section. We've tried our best always in answering most questions in our previous sessions. So we promise to make that happen today as well. With that, ma'am, over to you. Hi, Vidisha, and thanks for this very, very warm introduction. Um, hello, everyone. and. Uh, Welcome to uh, this masterclass, although I, I, I'd much rather call it a journey of discovering Tagore together rather than me trying to teach you something. But if there is something that you kind of uh, get inspired by or a few tricks of the trade that might work for you and your creative journey, I'd be delighted. Uh, so welcome. And uh, let me start because I'm a storyteller. Let me start with a, a small um, story about how all of this began. Now, somewhere around uh, 2006 or seven, I was uh, teaching in London and I was teaching in a comprehensive school um, and I used to teach maths. And a couple of rooms down from mine, the English rooms would begin. And um, the kids there uh, in year nine would have Macbeth as their curriculum. Now, this is inner city London um, or outer London. Um, the children are really from every country, every culture that you can think of. Um, and there's this whole thing of keeping Shakespeare alive for them. And of course, Shakespeare in English is not the easiest thing in the world for anybody to decipher. So I used to just love um, how they introduced it because the first thing they would do is sort of narrate the story, give a contemporary version of it, um, not get into the nitty gritty of the language at all, and they, they would just ask children to play with the scenes. Um, and you know, once in a while, I'd see a child with uh, a bed sheet running across the corridor with two holes in it. And I assumed uh, that was Banco's ghost. Somebody would be you know, doing uh, Macbeth in Jamaican Patois. I'd see a Bollywoodized version. This is sort of just about the time uh, uh, Macbool was becoming big. But obviously, these are kids. So um, I don't know how far um, they worked with it. And around me, um, I saw a lot of interest and I thought, you know, Shakespeare is truly alive. Yeah. And he's truly alive because there is the classical exploration of his work. And then there is this, there is taking Shakespeare to younger audiences, global audiences, and people who we would assume would normally not go and see a Shakespeare play or be interested. Um, so there'd be kids doing rap on Macbeth. And it, it was just fascinating to watch because once you stop uh, telling people how to interpret um, a poet or a great writer and you just let their own creativity come to the fore a little bit, you find that uh, it's stunning. Um, so instead of kind of freezing him uh, uh, sort of in memory by saying, you know, this is the only way we will remember our icon, they set him free. And in setting him free, they made him truly immortal. And for a long time, I loved this. And I thought, you know, how do I do this with Tagore? I've always been a Tagore fan. Uh, um, 
you know, I wake up in the morning and listen to his music, all of that. And then lockdown struck. Um, then I started with uh, translating his odd, odd, his odd verses. And one day I thought, why not make it systematic? Why not do one of his operas? And I thought, okay, let me start with Maya Arcala, which I'm calling the illusion game. It could be called the game of illusions, the game of fantasies. And the, the Maya, the word Maya can mean in many, a multiple, you know, multitude of things. So I'm going to go with the illusion game as a working title for now. But the whole objective, when I started doing this, I told him, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? And what I'm trying to achieve is take Tagore or his songs, because this is a musical, to a generation that would otherwise not read him, um, that stands at risk of uh, getting very intimidated by the Bangla that we do not speak nowadays, um, or by translations that are of a kind, and perhaps not find their own joy in deciphering them. And I uh, kind of wrote a little mantra for myself. And this is my exercise book. It kind of says there. And I said, I democratize or universalize or contemporize to go. Although the word contemporary is moot because when you're playing, uh, you don't want to limit anything to any time. And I'll come to that later. The other thing I was very, very clear about in my head was that these were songs being translated and Tagore's songs always rhymed. He was in fact a master at, um, you know, um, rhythm. He was a master at playing with words, at playing with alliteration, uh, not just imagery. So I wanted to at least showcase some of it. My limited ability obviously meant that there was, you know, there would be a gap. And, and then I went ahead and did that. And of course, while I was doing it, I was terrified because when you love something too much and that something happens to be a, a great poet, um, it's very intimidating to say, I love your work so much, I've decided to play with it. Um, but I allowed myself to play with it. And uh, as I started, I started playing more and more with his style, with his words. Um, and what I'm going to do now is show you a little bit about what I've managed to do. And we'll take the questions from there. So I'm going to share the screen. And I'm going to say share screen. And the first thing I'm going to open up to so that uh, I can give you a little bit of perspective is this first song where the opera opens. And the entire plot of the opera is about people falling in and out of love. And love is seen as this game uh, of illusions and fantasies, this maya, that the fairies weave for human beings. And there's a very famous song that it begins with. It's called Mura Jale Sthale Koto Chale Maya Jal Gathi. So, you know, there's this wonderful little rhyme, Jale Sthale Chale. But, you know, at that time, I was still learning. And I thought, okay, let me just start. So the web of magic, basically, is there in front of you. And this is really the essence of the song. And I think if you read it, you'll see that I've made sure that it rhymes. So over land and sea with such deceit, we weave our web of magic. We craft dreams and fill idle eyes, steal into hearts to mesmerize. We weave our web of magic. We raise drunken waves in the spring breeze, make buckle rose yearn for the buzzing of the bees, we sink hopes with half-sung songs and tunes incomplete with this magic web we weave. The hearts of men and women we bind in bonds of witchery. How they laugh, how they weep, how they suffer love's trickery. 
We magic and shadows in the midst of sweet union make sundered lovers dream of finally finding communion. We bring in pride and confusion. We usher in the tragic. We weave our web of magic. Now, not just uh, that, what I then went on to do um, is play a little bit more. I got, you know, more and more um, sort of brave. And there was this wonderfully talented, wonderfully talented design intern called Shumedha Ghosh, who did an internship of two months with me at my studio. And I gave her a little brief. I told her, you don't have to limit it to culture. You don't have to limit it to a certain time or place. Interpret it as you wish to and give me a graphic novel interpretation of this. What if I made a graphic novel out of this opera? And this is what she did. She did three nature fairies for the fairies. Um, one who's childlike, one who's sort of uh, young, and one who's old. Um, and I'm going to just show you the first one here. So the same song. Right. Um, so there were two or three things I had to decide on when I was you know, translating to go for the first time. One was, of course, that I would make, you know, I wanted him to rhyme. The second thing I wanted was for the longest time, I did not want the language to necessarily be too... Um, difficult um, and that's that's a very strange thing to say because um, you know his own voice I mean, his, his vocabulary even his words were like caviar uh, so to say I'm going to uh, keep it relatively simple um, I then had to make sure absolutely make sure that it was at the very least lyrical or musical to my ears there was also the choice I had. Uh, you'll notice me when I've written Bakul. I had the choice of keeping certain Indian words in their original Indian form. And I chose to do so because, you know, there's absolutely no point trying to uh, call Bakul something else. Um, or um, there's, a, there's a line there where he's, you know, used the word Rahu for obsession. I kept the word as Rahu because now, I mean, global audiences, all of us being uh, the way we are, there's a certain base level of awareness that has uh, sort of uh, started happening. So I'm going to now take you to um, the graphic novel again, where our hero, Amar, is deserting his girlfriend Shanta and the song is called uh, The First Spring. It says, is this the first time that spring arrives? My heart is restless fire with the flush of new desire as if with new life I arise. My heart wants to explore this world filled with bliss. Who does it wish to prize? On her quest I'll search beyond the horizon. So this is the first time I decided, you know what, I'm going to make sure I kind of rhymes and I'm not going to force fit it. Can I play and can I put the word on here and can I, you know, make it work with Horizon? I'm a beginner. When I did this, I didn't ask anybody. Perhaps it's uh, agreeable to some people. Perhaps it not. it's not. But what I'm trying to tell you is that I decided to play and, and, and not be afraid. Um, and the interesting thing about this is, if I take you now to the graphic novel sketch of this, I want to show you the next few pages to just give you an idea of how, um, how it was imagined visually. 
So, so this is the song. Is this the first time that spring arrives? And you'll notice there's a bit of a, uh, for want of a better word, a bit of a Bridgertonization of uh, uh, of the treatment. And we we were having a lot of fun with that. We didn't want to stop ourselves, um, so we went with that. So this is Amar. He has a handsome face, but a slightly weak face. And of course, his heart is restless fire uh, with the flush of new desire. And he's full of beans. And you know, as if with new life, I arise, my heart wants to explore this world, etc. And the, you know, the, the fairies here, and she added a touch that I loved him. They say, uh, tat And then there is this image of the fairy sort of uh, at the panel. And they're saying, she's near, but you do not perceive on whose distant quest do you leave. And then we'll come to the flowers. I and mean, if you notice, these are hibiscus flowers. We, we were very keen uh, that we'd go with the flora and fauna of India. We'd give it a timeless kind of Regency feel. We'd play with uh, the time and the clothing and the culture and make it everything belonging to everything. Um, and we wouldn't stop ourselves. Uh, of course, it is not a purist's treatment, but the whole idea is to let everyone explore. And I was delighted when Sumedha decided she would go with it completely. Um, this third song, by the way, is a very famous, it's a hit song by Tagore. It's called uh, Amaru Poranu Jaha Chai, where, um, where there's an interesting discovery we make that she grieves his going, but she's, you know, all the lines that say, I have found you in myself. There is nothing that I miss. Now, when we were first looking at this, and Sumedha has all of 18 and I'm all of 50. So we had two distinct lenses. She said, oh, my God, you know, what a doormat. And I thought, oh, my God, she's so self-contained. Uh, and of course, being an animal lover, as you some of you who follow my uh, blog, you might know. Um, the one way that I find self-containment uh, very largely is, is with an animal. And so we decided to give Shanta a cat. Uh, obviously, nowhere in Tagore, but somewhere we felt it rounded out her personality quite beautifully. So there's this last line when he's going away and says, if you find someone else to love, if you never return, may you find the joy you go in search of. May I grieve the love that you spurn. Um, so... Coming back, I'm going to kind of stop sharing for a minute. And I am going to now take the first little break before we uh, move on to the uh, new thing. And I'm going to ask uh, Bidisha or Kanika to um, share the little video where I talk about uh, a little bit what about my process. They are. This, for example, is the Bhagavad Gita, translated by Christopher Isherwood and Swami Prabhavanan. The books are here. Obviously, all the books I have in the house I read, but the books that are here have something to do with what I'm doing now or what I do regularly. And they're not usually what one thinks they are. This, for example, is the Bhagavad Gita, translated by Christopher Isherwood and Swami Prabhavananda. Now, you might think it's because of religious reasons, but actually I have it because this is an example of how something that's created just in verse has been translated because you want to keep the meaning simple and use really easy language, translated partly with verse and partly in prose, keeping the ease of the reader in mind. And in that sense, it's one of the most user-friendly books I've read, uh, you know, translations of the Gita that I've read. It's, it's a very simple book. Mm. So just starting with that, of course. Uh, then I have books that I like to just look at as part of my daily routine. So The Artist's Will by Julia Cameron. This is something I'm practicing right now. It involves daily journaling. So... Here's my journal, or this one is my soon-to-be-over journal. And I'm going to quickly, not quite give you a peek, but sort of show you. And I write in it every day or almost every day. 
So this I do first thing in the morning. And sometimes if I want to think a little more about if I'm feeling a little bit stuck or hopeless, I look into one of the chapters and read it because I find her very encouraging and very gentle and very kind. And often writers are not kind with themselves. And you want a bit of the critic in you, the inner critic, but you don't want the inner critic to destroy you. So, um, so you know, so it's and it's it's a very normal thing when you begin because you've read a lot of books and you know what really good stories and really good writing you know it looks like. But what you're writing because you're a beginner is not so good. So it's very important then to have someone who's encouraging you. And usually, we're not always lucky to have people like that around us. But this is a writer who's on your side and she'll help you. So if you ever thinking, I would always always recommend that you get a copy of this book. It's on Amazon, but I think Storyteller at Kolkata also keeps it, and most bookstores keep it. The other book I want to talk about is, um, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, we've talked about my Chalantika. There are books I keep if I want to. Right. Um, are we back um, on screen? In which case, I'll... Uh, yeah, great. Um, I'll talk about um, how there were certain innovations um, I learned pretty much while translating, or you could say certain leaps of faith that I started taking, which... Uh, might work for some people, might not. Um, so there are two, two, two or three things that, um, you know, just give me a bear with me for a moment. Let me just get my... So this book is called Chaluntika. This is a old uh, Bengali to Bengali uh, thesaurus. Um, and this is my grandfather's copy. It's 70 odd years old. And one of the first things I do, especially when I look at Tagore, is I look the word up here with great care because uh, it's fragile. And if I find uh, the meaning and it, it tells me exactly, um, if my vocabulary allows me to kind of understand it, then I just go with that. If not, I might use my mobile phone and do a search, I'm, I'm bilingual on the phone. So, you know, uh, type the word out in Bangla and just say what does it mean and uh, look for alternate words and meanings. I parallelly, obviously, uh, check out as many interpretations and meanings that are possible. And for that, I use an exercise book because I sort of need all of them. So very often, this is what it looks like. I mean, I'll probably type out the original in Bangla, write out the original in Bangla, copy it out, and then start trying out um, versions in English and keep scratching them if they don't fit and finally do a fair version uh, in the next page. And this one is a lot more scribbly, so it'll give you an idea. Oh, oh, am I getting the thing right? For some reason, my camera is... Yeah, there you go. So, you know, the original is written in Bangla and it's in green and there'll be like three different versions that I'll try out in the ballpoint pen and then eventually I'll probably have a fair version uh, right at the bottom, which then eventually goes to the uh, yellow PPT that you see. And of course, then on my blog. The third thing I started doing when I um, started discovering to go was my own realization of why Mayarkhala or why the illusion game is such a different kind of a opera from what I expected it to be. Uh, when I was 18 or 20 and I just used to sing the song, I just thought, oh my God, so-and-so is a doormat, so-and-so is uh, empowered, so-and-so is weak, so-and-so. It, it, it was very... There were these snap judgments made. Now, when I look back, I realize the context of it. And if you're, uh, you know, a member of my, uh, if you follow my blog, the first post basically sets that context. That Tagore was asked, he was commissioned to write this by a, by the principal of a women's school. And this whole opera was performed by women for women, closed door audience. And oddly enough, and they were 16, 17 year old, and maybe a little bit younger, and he chose the topic of love. 
And for a long time, in fact, I mentioned it to a friend of mine who said, my God, isn't it like very brave of him? And for a while, I thought, oh, my God, we really, I mean, uh, you know, there are so many other topics to write about with young girls. But why is he talking about love? Um, and as I started, you know, translating my arcana more and more on the illusion game, uh, what I found was it was a very interesting look at love as an archetype. Now, I don't know if you um, are aware of the word archetype, but there are two concepts I want to just bring up here. One is love as an ideal. So you look at, um, let's say, any of our Indian love stories, you know, um, any of the ones that we know about. And there's this snapshot, whether they're tragedies or whether they're, um, uh, you know, with, even if it's a Cinderella, there's, it's a snapshot, happily ever after, or forever sundered, or, you know. It, therefore, we can apply certain judgments to them. Love as an archetype is all these characters basically mirror certain kind of tendencies. They all have their flaws. They all have their strengths. And it only unfolds when we see the whole graph. So the interesting thing to see is um, how does uh, Shanta's uh, character, this, this girl with the cat who's kind of left by, um, according to me, uh, who's left uh, by Amar, the hero. Uh, I always thought she was such a doormat. When he comes back, she accepts him. But when I sit and translate him, I realize she's actually very uh, self-contained. And she asks him, um, interestingly, do you know your own mind? And I don't mind if you're here, but do you know your own mind? Um, Amar is actually quite imperfect, but very real. He's the hero who has this wonderful relationship, but therefore is very curious about what else is there out in the world for him. And he's quite selfish in the way he leaves her and he goes. And he goes and meets Pramada, who is the third person in the story, and he's dazzled by her. But she, for her own reasons, you know, rejects him. And he comes back to Shanta, rejected. And he says, oh, I love only you, which is when Shanta says, you know, do you know your own mind? And as they're about to get married, because he said, yes, 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 I know you. Uh, I know it's you. I only love you. Uh, as they're about to get married, and if you follow my uh, blog, you realize Pramada returns. So that moment, that moment of, give me, just bear with me. Uh, I've got somebody calling me and I really need to go on flight mode. Um, that moment of, Seeing Pramada face to face and deciding whether he really loves her or not is also necessary. So that moment happens for Amar. And I'll, I'll leave the suspense be because you know there's still a few more songs to go. Pramada is very interesting. Outwardly, she looks completely you know, sorted. Uh, in fact, I'm going to share a few uh, visuals from the graphic novel for you to uh, take a look at. She really looks completely in control of her decisions. She's very happy to have lots of suitors. She um, doesn't necessarily want, uh, you know, uh, to get tied down. And she meets this guy, Amar, whom she does like at first sight. It, I mean, she feels the love, so does he. But she has a big problem. She listens to her girlfriends far too much. And her peer group is far more into this power play of flirting than she is. And she's a pawn in their hands because they're good approval means a lot to Pramada. And so therefore, these characters, and some of them are actually not likable at all. Forget, forget hero or heroine material. But what they are is very real. And, um, and the commentary on this is done by the fairies, basically. They ask and at every point, they kind of decide. So I'm going to stop here for a minute, again, share my screen and show you two songs where Pramada appears very, very uh, self-assured. Um, and also because they're visually very beautiful. And I want you to take a look at this uh, concept of a graphic novel of Tagore. So before we move on to questions, I just want to hang on. OK, so very, very quickly. 
Uh, so this is Pramada and her girlfriends. And, uh, you know, there's a bit happening there. And we wanted to make sure they're young and, you know, they're very schoolgirlish because we wanted that parallel of schoolgirl peer pressure. So this is the song where one of the girlfriends, because a little bit of sense, who says, Shukhi bohe galo bala, sakhi. I kept the word sakhi, by the way. I didn't always use girls or girlfriends or that kind of thing. The day passes in frivolity. How long can this delude you? The boundless thirst that is love, why does it still elude you? And just watch her expressions change. When in this life will you allow the heady meeting of eyes, sweet immolation in that tender pyre, let new lo laws of love arise. Sakhi, tender liquid tears will well up in your eyes in a while, melancholy waters that slowly douse your sharp quicksilver smile. When dejected sighs turn desperate, hope and despair break your heart in two, inner truth will then bloom on your cheek in its bashful rosy hue. Um, and not only is this uh, the change in expression, absolutely, in my view, brilliant by um, Sumedha, who's done this fantastic job. This next song, I, I thought I, I, this was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, let it go, dear one, let it go, for love is just a lie. This is her uh, sort of her ego speaking and her sense of power speaking or what she perceives as power, sweetheart that love possesses, the tender pain caresses. Right, so here we are. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm going to go back to StreamYard. And I am ready for your questions. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and my little talk and what I've been trying to do. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, ma'am. I was completely uh, blown away and especially, you know, uh, being a Bengali myself, I've grown up literally dancing and singing to the tunes and the words of Tagore. So uh, this entire concept of a graphic novel, especially, you know, for the younger generation and the entire, every single state, because it's translated in English, it's it's just so beautiful. I uh, do have two questions for you. One is there in the comment section. But before I go into that, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, you are a regular writer on stack.me and people there is a large community that love reading your work um you know mm -hmm. on translating to gore so uh, my question especially was there are so many other um writers and uh, who are complete amateurs and they are just starting out and you know there are so many writers who are looking into uh, getting into the field of translation and um, be it tagore or be it any other writer for that matter what should be if i if i would ask you to just um just tell me a couple of pointers for them to keep in mind when they're just starting out as translators uh, what are the few pointers that they need to keep in mind the must uh pointers that they need to keep in mind when they're getting started well um i can see some familiar names here posting comments and i'm really delighted thank you because you know um <laughs> um it's a joy to see people who read your work kind of participating. It's such a joy. Um, so the first thing uh, that I would say uh, matters is trying to be honest with what you think the writer means. Because, you know, uh, any act of interpretation in, in, in uh, literature or poetry or art is basically the poet or the creator speaking to the person who's reading it. And that's always a unique communication. So what I interpret the, the, interpret the words as, even if I understand the language, the emotions, uh, how I see it, um, and how someone else may see it can be two different things. So there is that level of slight bias that does come. And so one has to be very mindful of what do you still think the writer wanted to say? 
And I think the big test in translation, at least for me, is when you finish doing it, because it's a work in progress, and at least with um, Stack, I've been doing it serially, and I mean, that's why I call it a journey of discovery, because when I began, I had a certain set of views. When I'm ending it, my own views have morphed. So I would actually go back and say, does this still hold true? Do I need to change any of the words anywhere? Do I need to go back and alter any of the verses? Because the first thing is to be honest with what you think the creator, original creator meant. Um, and that will always be subject to uh, the times we live in, uh, our context, but also the historical context. And therefore, I think the greats, whether we're talking about, you know, Ghalib or Shakespeare or Tagore, uh, the greats periodically uh, need to be reinterpreted. So the graphic novel, for example, I saw this lovely uh, question from uh, Nandita Basu. Uh, I know her. Uh, and uh, hi, Nandita Kakima, how are you? And um, uh, the thing to answer is, you know, the cat. I haven't actually shared the graphic novel. This is, this is a sneak preview. This is a first. And hopefully, if you know, if I can make a little bit of money, um, I'll probably do certain panels as finished things for people to keep. So there was no hullabaloo because actually you're the first ones to see it. We decided to give, um, between Sumedha and myself, we decided to give Shanta a cat because we just thought, I mean, she's unbelievably self-assured. How can she be so self-assured without a pet? And both of us, yeah, you know, we like our pets. And she said, you know, let, let's give her a cat. And... Uh, and that somehow lent her this air of inner strength. I mean, um, I'm a very big believer in pets, and I do believe they, they really add to our lives in a way that, uh, I don't know what I'm doing with my hair, forget it, um, in a way that nothing else does. So when, when this man abandons her so very cruelly, uh, I think part of her strength and part of that thing saying, you know, Fine, I will love you when you come back. If you don't, my heart is yours, etc. But that self-assurance that I always felt the songs had and the lyrics had, that I think can only come if you have something else that's holding you, either your, uh, you know, something, a hobby, your creative outboard or a pet or something. And I sense that only this time when I'm like 50 years old, 18-year-old um, uh, Sumedha, who's my uh, design intern, didn't. She said, my God, what a doormat. And that's exactly what I thought when I was 18. So it, it's a bit of a curve. So there's a bit of a bias there. But what I did find on uh, translating more and more of Tagore is that he unfolds for you like many creators. And therefore, you try your level best to express what he meant at that time, perhaps for a newer audience. You play a little but you're trying to express a certain emotion. I was trying to express a self-contained independent woman. And I played with the words and I gave her a cat. But, <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, visually, we've not been necessarily loyal with the words. We've just played. Um, just as in Bridgerton, people have played with music, we've played with plot, played with the time. We, we just wanted to play a little bit. But in my blog, I've stuck to the words and the emotion um, and off late, I have contemporized the illustrations just to just to take away from that very Rabindrik, as we call it, that thing. I, I wanted to free him from that sense of time and make him timeless because he is timeless and his work is timeless. And that's why I put up, you know, art by Hilma Klimt or uh, a poster of Hugh Grant and Four Weddings and a Funeral um, or, or Bogey and Bacall, which are really, they're not necessarily rooted in our culture. They're timeless. But so is he. And, you know, when you see the lyrics accordingly, uh, he makes sense. So that I, I don't know if that answers your question. Absolutely. I uh, I do have a follow-up question now because, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the answer that uh, Tagore or Ghalib writers like these need to be reinterpreted time and again, which is a very important point, I feel, you know, be it with Tagore or be it with Ghalib these people have not only written stories, but they've expressed emotions in some way or the other, be it, and especially when it comes to Tagore, um, he uh, wrote about love uh, in various ways, 
in eclectic forms literally mm. which mm. also keeps changing with time i mean the concept of love that existed then is not necessarily similar to what it is now so um how do you think that uh, that can be incorporated when you know i'm translating like this wonderful example of the cat that you've brought in or the love for pets you know so um how can these things be kept in mind while also not kind of getting into trouble as the question was put there like so, you know, there... that is why that is why i did not uh, reveal the graphic novel until today because this was a very private little secret project that um uh, sumedha and i did together and we said let's play uh, and let's just see what what we can do and, and the interesting thing that happened is sumedha who does not read bangla uh, but is interested found that she got um, interested in the whole uh, translation thing um i found um that when i uh, played with the images a, a little bit and i i changed i um, i could explore new possibilities of thought because you know initially when i was just translating the verses as they were happening as you, as you see it on the blog as you see it on stack.me um there were certain views i was forming as i was uh, translating but then over time i realized you know uh, amar's return etc that these characters the thing that is very timeless about them is none of them are perfect right and perhaps none of them are very nice and you know certain things that, i mean i'll tell you what i found really timeless this this peer pressure of girlfriends this is such a common thing and it's such an it's quite sensitively dealt with in my arkala the fact that ramada thinks she is this wonderful independent woman she thinks she's calling the shots but actually push comes to shove when she sees this guy whom she actually likes and it is love at first sight for her because the girlfriends are so dominating on what they feel uh, she should do she doesn't have the courage to go up and uh, acknowledge his love um and that you know it's it's completely timeless that as a concept so some things don't change with time i mean the nature of love the archetypal nature of love doesn't change with time if instead of the fairies today i put a bunch of um 50 60 something auntie gees sitting who seen life <laughs> it would absolutely hit spot on because they have seen that whole curve of love and they know that you know you take a little snapshot and you get a tragedy or you take another little snapshot and you get a happy ending but you see the whole curve of it it's just life right which is really what um, all their songs are about the fairy songs that's really wonderful and i think um, it is about time in case there are no further questions thank you so much um uh for this wonderful wonderful uh masterclass and this is something that is kind of very close to my heart i loved the discussion and i loved you know the graphic novel concept in itself and um so definitely i mean um, thank you so Shimura, much manisha i had a question to ask and i had i would love to ask it of the audience that is there because they're all age groups i can see um yeah. some of them are my parents contemporaries and some are younger so the question i wanted to ask was um if we created a few of the panels if we took them from the storyboard concept to complete it maybe one song or two and we kind of put it out what do you think people would be interested in this treatment because um ideally between sumedha and myself we would love to find time to do these in a systematic manner but we don't know how it's going to be perceived we had a wonderful time doing it um and and i've got the initial storyboard in place but we just didn't know until today and i'm waiting for the master class to unveil it mm. how people will react to it they might love it they might hate it but my principal aim is to actually reach out to people who would otherwise not explore him otherwise not read him, whatever the age so the graphic novel is for a, perhaps a slightly younger or slightly more visual audience um the blog as it stands or uh, if we make zines or anything out out of the scenes as, as they stand that's probably for an audience that does not feel the need for a visual crutch um, but my whole 
mission is to take it forward in multiple ways for multiple people as long as it reaches people. That's all I want, really. So if you could just ask and if you get any feedback on that, I'd be delighted to know. We would love to, ma'am. Absolutely, we would love to. And uh, especially someone who is currently in that younger generation kind of community, I would say we would love to read translated versions of Tagore because as you said, you know, as you've spoken about Sumedha, who doesn't read a lot of Bangla, but is very interested in Tagore in general. So are we, you know. And uh, when it comes to the graphic novel uh, structures, is where, you know, people from different states and not only people who know how to read Bangla can interact on the same as well. So um, definitely we would love to, but I will uh, put this question up. Uh, we do, we will have a follow up blog after the masterclass, you know, about this masterclass and we'll share snapshots, uh, you know, of what you've spoken about. Uh, and definitely I'm sure people will reach out. We do have a comment section as well uh, on stack.me now. So um, that's where people can reach out about their responses and uh, that can work. So one last thing for the audience here that I wanted to say, you know, is basically to follow the work as a as a blog, you'll have to uh, use, uh, you have to click on any one of the blog posts that I have, go there and click on a follow button and give your email ID, then it comes as a newsletter or your WhatsApp number. Until you do that, you will not regularly get it because beyond a point post Maya Kala, uh, I will not be sharing this regularly on uh, social media. I might... Uh, you know, do the odd post, but by and large, I would expect people to be following me because it's just so much work to keep asking people to follow. Um, so if you're really interested, if you're curious, because once I finish my Arkhala, um, I am obviously thinking of uh, some more Rabindranath. Um, I, I would just uh, really love to have followers. That would help. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. And I'm really sure that you've inspired um, a lot of people in this on their journey of translation. And for those who are not sure uh, to use an appropriate platform for your work, Stack.me is the place for you. Um, follow uh, Jashodhara Ma'am on her Stack.me account. And thank you everybody for joining. See you guys in the coming weeks with a different topic and a different creator. So till then, have a great week. Thank you, Ma'am, once again. Uh, bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.